we're starting a brand new way of teaching at the feast. We're starting something exciting. God is birthing a whole new generation of people who will hunger to follow the word. By book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, story by story. We're gonna sit at the master's feet with total humility and allow the text as divinely inspired to speak to our hearts. Get ready because we're gonna start this journey of longing and really understanding God and His Word for you. I know that you guys are excited for a word from God today. So without further ado, let's say our favorite family prayer here at the feast as we come in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody lift your hands towards the air and then say this with me. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today, I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I am God's servant, and I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, to give the utmost love, honor, and respect that only God deserves. Can you do this? Can you lift one hand towards the heavens? And then everybody lift your voices as we sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's actually my prayer for all of us today, that as we lean in on God's Word, that this will light up the way and this will guide every step that we need to take this week. Amen. We are in talk nine, all right? This is actually the last talk of the series, Miracles and More. That's right. I know. Gone too soon, right? But anyway, the reason why we're ending this, this series is because this is the end where Matthew talks about the nine miracle stories that we have been studying. Here is the talk title for today. I want you to write this down. Make me whole. Before we study and read the Word of God, let me first explain how we got here. Okay, these are for people who might be joining us for the first time, so we're going to give you a chance to catch up. And just in case you don't know this, all right, we have been studying the entire Gospel of Matthew for an entire year now, all right? An entire Gospel, verse by verse, line by line, sentence by sentence, chapter after chapter, and it has been enriching our lives. I hope that you agree with me on that one. And so this is your recap, okay? From chapter 5 to 7, in the book of Matthew, we saw how Jesus describes the kingdom, right? Remember how he preached on the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus was saying that he was building this new kingdom like no other. And then from chapter 8 to 9, we saw how Jesus displayed the kingdom. How? Through nine miracle stories, right? That Matthew said. And then from chapter 10, right? We're actually on the tail end of chapter 9, heading towards chapter 10. We're going to see and study today how Jesus delegates the kingdom where? To His apostles, you know, to His disciples. So today, we're going to talk about the power of delegation. Delegation is a powerful thing, and I hope that you will be able to see this after the talk, okay? Because you see, Jesus performed miracles, yes? But He didn't do it to feed His ego, no. Jesus was not making a one-man superhero movie, no. Jesus was actually making and building His own Avengers team. Jesus had no interest in being the only superhero superhero in the universe where everybody runs to him, you know, whenever they need rescuing. No, Jesus was raising a team of superheroes. And guess what? 
you're one of them. You're one of those people that Jesus needs to rescue other people. That's why our big message for today, this is a declaration, okay? Here it is. God's love flows through me. Amen. God's love flows through all of us right now. So throughout the talk, here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask you to make seven powerful faith declarations. All right? Are you guys ready? All right. Here's the first one. I'm a shepherd. Hallelujah. I want you to now turn your Bibles to the last part of Matthew chapter 9. We're about to end the chapter and we're going to jump into a new one shortly after. Okay, so turn to Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. And it says right here that Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And then, verse 36, when Jesus, he, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Let me explain this, all right? In the original Greek language, when they wrote this, all right, they actually didn't have a word that could describe what Jesus felt at that time. The Greek word that they used was this, all right? I'll try to pronounce this as best as I can. It says, shflagnistis, shflagnistis, all right? You can Google that. It simply means being moved to your bowels. Why bowels? Because it's short of saying that you are being moved to the deepest, innermost part of your being. In, in, in fact, the word compassion doesn't even fully express it, you know, but it's the closest word in the English language that could describe what Jesus felt at that time. That's why this is not your usual type of compassion where, you know, you, you one day you see an ad about starving African children and then you're like, oi. Kawawa naman sila. But then 30 seconds later, you're eating ice cream and then you're adding items into your Lazada cart. No, that's not the kind of compassion that this is. This is the authentic, genuine kind of compassion where Jesus felt their pain and then He had pity on them. Why? Because He loved them. And you know what? This is good news for you and me. Because I want you to know that Jesus feels your pain. And the reason why Jesus feels your pain is because He loves you. That's right. He, he, he simply loves you. And I love this verse because it simply shows us the compassion of Jesus. Knowing that He was not blind or you know thick-skinned or dense. In other words, He was not insensitive like some people. God knows how you feel. Amen to that. But what is compassion anyway? Here's a definition, all right? Compassion is actually passion plus action. That's one of the ways that you'll know that your compassion is real. How? If it moves you into action. Because without action, you know, compassion is not real. For compassion to be real, it must move you into action. That's why Jesus, He felt the pain of the people. And what happened? He was moved by it. All right, it moved Jesus to do something. So how did it move Jesus? Jesus simply looks at the crowd and then he says they were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus was moved to give them a shepherd. And his ultimate solution was not actually to give them one shepherd. Yes, he was the one true shepherd. But here's what he did. He multiplied himself. That was his solution because he knew that a time will come when Jesus would need to go back to the Father. So Jesus had to multiply himself. He wanted to raise other shepherds like him. You see, my dear friends, everyone can have a leader. We have a bounty of leaders in this world. But here's the thing, not everybody can have a shepherd. We have a, there's a rarity in shepherds nowadays, so God is calling you to be one of his shepherds. Amen. Next faith declaration, I am God's co-worker. Jesus says this in verse 37, all right? Let's go back. He says that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Let me explain, okay? A harvest is a good thing, yes? But a harvest without workers, you know, it's just plain wasteful, right? Why? Because no matter how much harvest you have, if you don't have the laborers or the workers to reap the bounty, it'll just go to waste, right? I remember our old neighbor's duhat tree that was sitting in their backyard, you know? Every single year, I tell you, how many of you like duhat? Raise your hand. You've ever seen a duhat tree? It is so fruitful, right? So every year, this tree would produce so much fruits. But here's the problem. None of them in their family liked duhat. So what happened? 
the, the fruits, you know, they just fell into the ground. You know, it became a complete waste. Here's the truth. The potential of every harvest will just go to waste if there are no laborers to yield them. Because without harvesters, there will be no harvesting. So where can God find His workers? Where can God find harvesters? Look in the mirror. All right? It's not an accident that you are listening to this message today. God needs harvesters and God is calling you to be one of them. So say this faith declaration with me one more time. I am God's co-worker. Amen. Here's the third faith declaration. All right? Write this down. This is God's project. Let me explain. If you actually study the early years of the ministry of Jesus, you know the first thing that he did was not to pre-select his disciples. No. It wasn't to choose Simon, Peter. It wasn't to choose Andrew, James, John. No. That was actually the third on his list. Okay? Jesus did not put up a wanted disciples ad in FB. No. Looking for them was the third thing that he did. The first thing that he did was to pray. That's right. And then the second thing that he did was to ask us to pray. It says it right here, actually, in verse 38, where Jesus says, So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask Him to send more workers into His fields. Amen. You know, I love this. Because it simply says that the Lord is in charge of the harvest. So, in essence, you know, all this, this is the Lord's work. This is the Lord's business. This is the Lord's project. So whenever you get overwhelmed in ministry, you know, whenever some things are just not working out like you want it to, like for example, you know, some people are not accepting your invite, your feast, watch party. Some people are no longer attending your feast light, but you keep on trying. Always remember this, all right? You are not building it alone. God is building it with you because it's His kingdom. It's His project. It's His. That, re that releases us from all this tension, right? So one more time, everybody, type this down. This is God's project. Amen. Amen. This is just the, the word part, everybody. I'm going to pass you on next to Brother Bobo. Let's just end properly by singing one more time, everybody, in honor of God's word as we close. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One more time, everybody. Our big message is God's love flows through me. Hi, everybody. I am so happy that we have this time together. I want to dive right in and ask you this big question. Are you ready? Why do you go to church on a Sunday? And, and yeah, you. Why? A lot of people will answer to receive blessings from God, right? Can I share with you that that's an amazing answer, but it is not complete. How about this? I believe that the purpose of church is not to receive a blessing from God, but to be a blessing to the world. That's right. You know, why did God invent church anyway? I hope my answer will shock you. Are you ready? Here it is. I believe that church is not a place that you go to. It's a place that you create wherever you go. Wow, think about that. I really believe that church is to become God's love to the broken and wounded and fractured humanity. I believe that the purpose of church is not to fill up a building on a Sunday. No, the purpose of church is to fill you up with so much of God that wherever you go from Monday to Saturday, you're spilling God and His love and you're, you're, you're leaking, you're overflowing His kindness and His mercy and His compassion wherever you go. You are creating church. And so, our fourth faith declaration is, say this after me, I create church wherever I go. Say that again. Say that again. I create church wherever I go. I was talking to a woman and she, she was attending the feast for, for some, some, some weeks or months. And then she came up to me and she complained. She really did complain. She said, Brother Bo, I have a problem. I think you're not doing a good job 
with the feast. And then she explained why. She said, the people I meet who are attending the feast, they're not following Christ. And I said, what do you mean? And I said, I, she said, I meet boyfriends and girlfriends who are having premarital sex. It's clear, you know, by their language, etc. I also meet, I, I met a mistress. I'm, I'm sure she's one. Like, like the way she talked to me, you know, she, she is having an affair with the married man. And then there was this, there was this time, Brother Bo, when, when, when you, you, were, you were so happy. And then, and then there was this guy beside me. He cursed. <laughs> he actually cursed. And then, there, and then you know how often you say, you know, introduce yourself to that person beside me. And, and, and I did. And this woman introduced herself with her zodiac sign. I mean, doesn't she know that's of the devil? Brother Bo, I mean, there's something wrong, you know? And so, and listen to me, I do not blame her for her reaction. Because for a lot of people, we have been brainwashed to think that church is a gathering of good people, of holy people. That's what a church is, you know? You gather this good, holy people. But is that what church is? I believe the church is not about gathering, but it's about scattering. It's about scattering Jesus' followers into that world. Can, can, can I, can I, I, I know it's, I'm rocking your world here. But so I told her, you know what? You've joined a community whose sole purpose is to reach out to people who are far away from God. That's our sole purpose. People who, who don't feel comfortable with church and because they feel ashamed and so on. That's our sole purpose. Being there and, and, and with them. And so let me say this to you. I'm happy with your stories. I really, really am. I'm excited when you told me about these stories because that means we've succeeded. So I, I, I repeat. Our purpose is not to gather. Our purpose is to scatter ourselves into the world. That's who we are. And say that with me again, friends. I create church wherever I go. And, and so when I'm with them, I'm God's love to that person. Who, who is not following God, who, who has sin in the, his life. You know, I'm there and I'm God's love to the world. It's God's love who will change that person, not me. And I've, I've been in ministry for 40 years. I'm telling you, we're not very effective in changing people. Believe me. <laughs> but it's, it's when God's love does it. That's when changes happen. Friend, here's what I mean when you create church wherever you go. I'm inviting you. To think of one person. Now, now listen to me. You know, for a lot of people, it's all about what's church? Oh, church is attending. Church is like now online. It's watching this video. You know, oh, okay, what's what's both preaching? Oh, let, let me sing a few songs. Let me worship. Oh, let's let's go to mass. That's what we are, and 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 we should continue doing that. But that's an incomplete answer. Church is this. Think of one person that needs God in your life. You know, an office mate, some, someone you met at the gym. Some, one person, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four. But it starts with one person. And then what you do is you say, hey, can, can, we, can we do something special? You know, why don't you and I, we, we either meet through Zoom or, or, or physically like in the cafe of the, of, of the office, you know, or whatever, and, and a coffee shop. And then, yeah, yes, with masks and so on. <laughs> and then let's watch this talk. And so what you do is you, you pluck out the, the talk of the, of the feast. It's all online, right? And then you say, let's watch it together. And then after that, let's share and let's pray together. Creating church. And you do it every week, every week, every week. And what happens? You're bringing that person into the presence of God. That is church. Which brings me to our gospel um, in, in chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Jesus picked how many? Twelve disciples. How many tribes are there in, in the nation of Israel? Twelve. Is that an accident? Is that a coincidence? No, it's not. Jesus, he was forming the new Israel. 
Now, let me backtrack a bit to the Old Testament. And let me say that from the very beginning, when Jesus created human beings, he wanted them to represent him in the world. That's why he created us in his image and likeness. Now, when he said to man, you know, have dominion over the earth, what does that mean? To represent him and to be shepherds. That's the original idea. Now, if you read through Genesis 1 to 11, we messed up. Like, like all sorts of things happen and we fell and we sinned. That's what man did. And then in Genesis 12, what God did was he picked one family, Abraham, his family, to represent him. But from Genesis 12 all the way to the end of the Old Testament, we know that, you know, this family, the Israel, they, they didn't do a good job also representing God in this world. They messed up also. Now, Jesus enters the scene. And he creates this new Israel. He calls 12 people. And this is what happens. Let's read. Here are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also called Peter. Then Andrew, Peter's brother. James, the son of Zebedee. John, James' brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot. Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Um... I've been privileged to organize a few NGOs in my life. And you know, when you pick your board of directors, it is very important that you build your credibility in front of the government, et cetera, in front of people. And so what we've done is we've selected people who were uh, very respectable individuals, um, shakers and movers of society, that those are the people we seat into the board of directors. I want you to know that this list that I just read, there is no there is there is no prestige in this list. Believe me, there were no there were, there were no uh, priests there. There there were no politicians. There were no professors. There were no princes in that list. For crying out loud, these were uneducated blokes. Um, a number of them were smelly fishermen, and the most educated guy was was Matthew the tax collector who was also the most the most despicable in the eyes of the Jews you know he was called the scum of the earth according to the pharisees and then of course there was judas why would jesus pick judas i mean hello why not pick someone else but but you see it's you know when you when you read this list the first my first reaction when i read this list was jesus was not a very good picker no he he picked wrong especially if you think of judas and but guess what my first response was this jesus missed one meaning to say he chose 12 guys and it's one versus 11 you know meaning to say okay it's, it's more of like 11 versus one 11 good guys but he picked one bad apple judas right but then when i dug deeper into the gospels i was wrong i was absolutely wrong it was one verses 11. If you read through the Gospels, 11 of them became traitors. 11 of them ran away. Only one guy, John, stuck it out through the cross with Mama Mary. The 11 guys became traitors, especially Peter, the leader, right? Who, who, who denied Jesus. Now, again, let me say this. Jesus was a bad picker, but he was a good forgiver. And I don't know about you, but I like that because I need that kind of Jesus in my life because I messed up. But he comes and he still picks me and he still forgives me and he still uses me. And he says, Bo, go create church wherever you go. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Bo. Thank you, Brother Audi. It's such a beautiful time that we get to connect with you, dear family. Here's the fifth declaration. The message lives in me. And so reading from the Bible, from the passage, chapter 10, verse 5, it says, Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. So Jesus sent out the apostles. <clears throat> the apostoli word, Greek word, 
really means to be sent. And just want to let you know that we are all God's messengers. And what is unique is we're not just carrying any message. We're carrying God himself. We have to live the message. You know, we cannot just put Jesus or the message of Jesus in a, le- in, in a leather bag and then just have it for delivery. You know, we, we are God's messengers and we deliver. We become the living word that Jesus wants us to go through all the world. And we're saying here is Jesus is the message. And the point is the message needs to live in the messenger because God called us and God sends us out and what's the good thing for you in our next declaration is you don't have to do it alone God called you God sends you out and you're not alone because you know the power of God is with you the message is with the messenger and the sixth declaration says God performs miracles through me yes Jesus told them where to go, gave them the instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. This is not a matter of prejudice, but of progression. Take a look at this. When God blessed Abraham, he did not just want to bless Abraham and his family. He wanted to bless the world through Abraham. And the the goal is not to hoard the blessings, but the goal is we become so blessed, become so loved, we become so full that we are meant to give it away. Are you ready? The question, in the same way, God is not sending you to the entire world God is sending you to a small group of people, to specific people. Who are they? They can be your family who, are, who you're watching with this now. Or your, your relatives. This could be your office mates, your, your barcada, your K-drama mates. This could be your Viber group mates. Maybe share this message uh, in your Viber groups, in your messengers. And... and, and um, the instruction is you, you look for two or three people. When two or three are gathered in God's name, you, God is in their midst and you are already a feast. That's why I invite you in to, to, to try to tune in on our face light movement and, and just share God's message here. And, and this is the instruction of Jesus. After calling them by name and after giving them the instructions... He said, go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Can God's miracles really flow through us? Yes, definitely. Look around you. I want to hit at home. So many people are sick. Yes, there are so many people who are physically sick. But, you know, some people who's sick at heart. And because of their sick emotions they're sick in their uh, in their mental health that's why they become physically sick spiritual sickness leads to physical sickness as well because we are a whole person the good news is Jesus is making us whole again and we become those broken vessels where God can flow blessings to other people that is overflowing from us. Jesus wants us to be a vessel of healing. Jesus wants to perform miracles through us. That's why when I'm a doctor, I always say I am a doctor, I am a facilitator, but I'm not the healer. And I'd always say that it is God who's, who heals. I just become that broken vessel. And you may not be necessarily a doctor, who be a healer or whatever, but you who receives healing from God could spread that healing to others. So many people are dead, not necessarily physically dead, but they're internally dead. So many people walking out there like zombies, alive outside, but dead inside. And what Jesus wants us is we can help each other, we can raise each other to a new life, a new life with Jesus. Again, on our own, we cannot do it, but with God, anything is possible. God is giving us new hope. God is giving us new directions. God is reviving us in our dreams, our hopes and aspirations. Jesus wants us to, you know, 
heal the, the lepers. Call those people with leprosy. Not again literally, but figuratively. What are they? Who, who are those kinds of people? Those people who are insecure. Those people who do not love themselves. Who have very low self-esteem. Think less, so, so, so less of themselves. And those who, 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 who don't belong. God's call for us is for us to embrace them. Jesus wants us to embrace them and welcome back to the family. That's why the feast is the feast. Because who, whoever you are, come as you are, come and be one with the feast. And we are not the reason of the feast. Jesus is. And we are just merely messengers telling the people, come to the feast. There is healing here. There is hope here. Jesus is here. So many people are trapped in evil. Jesus commanded, cast out demons. What do we mean? We don't need to become exorcists here. Meaning, Jesus wants us to liberate God's people from sin, from hurting one another. God could replace our hurts with healing. God could put us in a life where we do good, create good, and be good. And through us, God can perform this. God doesn't need us actually. But it is such a privilege that God calls us by name. Recruits us and tells us, come, be part of the servants of the feast. Be part of my family. Be my disciple. Here's the seventh declaration. God's love flows through me. And this is the ending of the passage. Here it goes. Give as freely as you have received. The good news of the Lord today is you already have it. You already have the healing. You already have the provisions. The peace is there. God's love is already coming into your life. Embrace it. Accept it. And then it doesn't promise that we're never going to be broken. We're never going to be hurt again. It is in these cracks in our life that God's love, God's peace, God's anointing could flow. We are all wounded healers. We are miracle workers by God who also receives the miracle. The beauty here is when we connect with God, when we receive, and when God performs miracles, the miracles happen first to us. Because the principle is we cannot give what we do not have. And God doesn't want that. God wants you to be blessed. So that you could become a blessing to others. Sometimes God uses the breaking so that it become, becomes our blessing. What good word from the Lord today. Some, maybe you're hearing this and you're hurting. Some, maybe you're carrying so many things. You're undergoing through difficulty, trials, and you, you feel that you have nothing to offer. You're too sinful. Maybe you think you cannot love. And definitely, again, on our own, we really can't. But with Jesus, anything is possible. God calls you by name. And come as you are when He calls you. He doesn't call... He doesn't call the able. He calls the available. Just say yes. On your own, you can't really can't, you really can't. You need to let God love through you. I may not, I wouldn't have this life now if not for the yes of my parents to God. Because they said yes, I have the bigger chance to say yes to God. And you know why they said yes? Because there was a friend of our family who kept on inviting them to church, to, to join a marriage encounter, to join a weekly community gathering. People did not give up on them. And, they, and finally, they said yes to Jesus through persistence, through prayer, through fellowship. My parents got renewed in community. And because my parents got renewed, I grew up to be in a renewed Catholic community. It doesn't come without trials, difficulties, but it is during difficulty that God can turn it into a victory. Our mess is becoming our message. Our hurts become our stories of healing. That's God's word for you today. The disciples 
called Jesus, called by Jesus' name, one by one, sent. They were th- still afraid when Jesus was crucified and even resurrected. But only when the Holy Spirit came through the Pentecost that they become fired up, went out through all the world. And again, it didn't come without any persecution, trials, difficulty. Hey, Peter was, was crucified upside down. Matthew was stabbed. Thomas was pierced. Philip was killed in North Africa. But the good news here is they follow Jesus. And God is still recruiting His team, His servants, whatever you may call it. And maybe you would feel unworthy. You would feel, I'm not good enough. I'm too sinful. I'm not equipped. I am so terrified. I'm not good for this position, for this mission. My word today is let God love you. And let God loved through you. Mama Mary was too young. (laughs) Peter was a sinful guy. was so was so angry. Denied God. Paul persecuted Christians, but he, from Saul, he became Paul. God could perform miracles to those who receive His miracle first. God's love flows through me. The invitation is. I hope you say yes to Him. It's all yours. It's ours. The love of God is available. Maybe there's no direct stairway from heaven. But if you look beside you, your husband, your wife, your kids, your mother, your brother, your sister, your friend, your office mate, you could become God's love for people today. So we're going to end uh, like this. On a, on a small scale down note, hey, we cannot give what we do not have. We cannot fill a cup if our cup is not filled first. And the only way is when we allow God to fill us up. So our prayer today, Lord, come into our hearts so that we could become your heart for the world. One person at a time. I want you to think of that one person, one place, one colleague, one action that you can do. And as you're thinking about that, I invite you to allow God to love you. You are loved. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you did, God is calling you by name. If you are watching this right in this precise moment, live or even through replay, God is inviting you. God says to you, I love you no matter what. And I'm calling you as my child, as a servant, and go, go my child, go to the world, and be my heart. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.